As they took their first steps, humans have always felt the need to express themselves, to understand their reality. Voice and facial expressions were tools that allowed communication. But in their desire to go further, human beings realized that they could create something that could last longer, something that could circumvent the limits of time and allow them to embrace the fascinating and threatening reality that surrounded them. They could trap their memories by carving them into the rock. They could breathe their spirit into places as special as La Griega Cave, where those figures created thousands of years ago still communicate with us today. La Griega Cave, guardian of the signs of Pedraza. The blue sky of Castile is stripped of its mist and shines over the Sierra de Guadarrama. The Badillo River meanders through the recesses of a rugged landscape of deep valleys and breaks the mountain, creating a canyon before surrounding the town of Pedraza. The river, mischievous, has created numerous open cavities in the rock, generated by erosion over the years which appear along the course of its two banks. Several caves emerge along the flow of the river, but there's one of them that has captured the attention of archaeologists. La Griega Cave. It is located on the left bank of the canyon formed by the river, barely 50 meters from its course, and it stands out above the others because it contains evidence of human occupation or frequentation from the Upper Paleolithic period onwards. The cavern unfolds in a winding, not excessively branched route that, in general, follows a northeast-southeast direction. Its galleries, formed in limestone 100 million years ago, when dinosaurs still inhabited the Iberian Peninsula, reached a total length of just over 200 meters. To access the interior, you have to cross a small shelter and enter a tight vestibule, a narrow preview that takes us to the entrance gallery where the first Paleolithic and post-Paleolithic engravings can be found. If you look at the cave from above, you will see that it consists of an entrance gallery that extends for about 80 meters to the south. At this point, the cave branches off into three other galleries, each of which goes another 40 meters deeper. The archaeologists have divided this route into 10 sectors to facilitate its study. In the first one, which is closest to the entrance, there are already cave engravings, the presence of which increases as we go further in. Sector 3 contains the most numerous samples, and from Sector 4 onwards, the initial gallery is divided into three branches along which the remaining sectors are distributed. The numerous engravings and inscriptions kept in La Griega Cave make it a first-rate reference point for the study of rock art and Roman writing in the Northern Plateau. Different social groups have left their mark on it systematically from the last Paleolithic stage to recent historical times. This encouraged the appearance of numerous panels, cavities and ceilings covered with prehistoric engravings, Paleolithic and post-Paleolithic, Roman inscriptions and others from later periods. The concentration of such a diverse series of engravings has required the intervention of a large interdisciplinary team that brings together the experience of professionals from different university departments. But these treasures have followed an eventful path before they could be the object of academic study. The cast complex where the cave is located began to be explored and studied from a paleontological and ethnographic point of view from the 19th century onwards. 
In 1898, the scholar Tomás Llorente became interested in this spot dominated by the Griego stream. The name by which the current Vadillo River was known and which explains the popular toponym of La Griega Cave. His exploration allowed him to get to know this place where he noticed the existence of modern inscriptions on its walls without noticing the prehistoric engravings. The latter were not discovered until 1970 when Ballesteros and Herrera, members of the speleological section of the Madrid Sports Excursionist Society, identify the so-called discovery horse engraved on clay near the ceiling, about 45 meters away from the current entrance. From that moment on, numerous specialists became interested in knowing, studying, analyzing and dating the different cave paintings at La Griega Cave. In this process, the need to undertake a complete and systematic study of the engravings became evident. The prehistorian Maria Soledad Corchón, at the head of various research teams at the University of Salamanca, assumed the direction of this comprehensive project financed by the Castilla y Leon regional government with the collaboration of the Ministry of Culture which resulted in the publication, in 1997, of a complete monograph. Recently, research in La Griega Cave has focused on the application of new geotechnologies to the study and conservation of prehistoric art, particularly in cavities that cannot be visited due to the fragility of the sandy limestones and clays that serve as a support for prehistoric engravings and historical epigraphy that it houses. The discoveries made in La Griega Cave have revealed that it has been visited and used by very diverse social groups who have left numerous artistic manifestations on its walls. From the late Paleolithic to the Copper and Bronze Ages, from the Iron Age to the first centuries of our era, the signs of human presence are clear and countless. But, in addition, the subsequent epigraphy that has been preserved shows us that the place continued to be visited from the Visigothic period to the present day. La Griega offers us a dizzying journey through time. It's a journey that, through the engravings and inscriptions on its walls, takes us back to the earliest artistic manifestations on the surroundings of the Sierra de Guadarrama. Let us start step by step to enter the spiral of history. As for prehistoric gravings, more than 400 motifs have been described, as well as tangles and numerous loose lines. Overlapped on each other and covered by Roman epigraphy, they are schematic assemblages that can be divided into two large groups of inscriptions, Paleolithic and post-Paleolithic engravings. Most of documented Paleolithical art is dated in a period between 13,000 and 11,500 years before today. The density of engravings and the accumulation of figures on the panels attributed to this period imply the existence of socially structured prehistoric groups and, probably, a larger population than the one that could be expected from the mere transit of seasonal hunters. Altogether, there are 119 motifs that have been attributed to different moments of the Upper Paleolithic. Of these, 29 are signs and 90 are identifiable figurative representations. Among the latter, you can also recognize horses, deer, felines, wild boar, fish, bears or canines, and anthropomorphic figures. The study of these Paleolithic engravings has made it possible to classify them into four chronological phases. In the first stage, there are engravings of primitive construction and rough contours. They are located close to the entrance, inside natural domes they are executed with a linear, continuous stroke. These figures with a voluminous body and large triangular necks correspond mainly to horses, which may appear alone or in pairs, always showing lively attempts at animation and filling. 
Later, in the second phase, engravings with dual themes appeared. Anthropomorphic figures next to horses or horses next to deer. These new representations are engraved on top of the previous ones, causing them to be set in opposition to each other. In addition, there began to be a caricatured treatment of some figures, which are distinguished from others by their beaked or deformed heads. In the third stage, the engravings began to appear in the inner part of the cave, areas 7 to 10 and in them we can perceive an innovation in the treatment and placement of the figures. Silhouettes of horses or deer with sinuous profiles or pointed heads appear, along with other types of horses with a naturalistic tendency with thicker and heavier shapes. In this way, we find ourselves before a frieze made of equine figures, grouped in pairs whose representation splashes the entire route of the cave. In the last phase, certain monumentality appears due to the large size of the engravings and the type of fauna used in the models, felines and aurochs. After studying the layout of the cave, it has been hypothesized that it may have been used in Paleolithic times as a sanctuary or place of ritual celebration in two main phases. A first sanctuary with easy access and medium depth that it could have been used on successive occasions, perhaps seasonally. And a second sanctuary with difficult access located in the deep areas of the cave. The most used technique in these Paleolithic engravings is the simple incision with a wide 2 to 3 mm and marked line 1 to 2 mm deep. However, this method was not the only one they used. Other techniques can be seen in the figurative motifs such as digitalizations and incised or discontinuous strokes. Digitalization consists in the creation of a motif using the finger impregnated with a previously diluted coloring material. This method of pigment application is probably the most commonly used in Paleolithic art. As for the incised line, it is done by outlining a figure with the help of a pointed tool. In an incised line, the execution can vary significantly depending on the number of strokes, the orientation of the tool or the nature of the support. Finally, the discontinuous line, which differs from the incised line in the way it is applied and also in the tools used to do it. The main difference lies in the fact that the movement of the hand involves a repeated hit by direct or indirect percussion rather than a continuous and homogeneous drag. It is interesting to note the use and integration of the cave's own nooks and crannies in the different representations. Thus, for example, hollows are used to mark the heads of the equids and changes in level or small ledges to highlight details such as the eyes. This period, after the Paleolithic, but still prehistoric, is between the 3rd and the 1st millennium BC. It begins in the Copper Age and extends to the Early Iron Age. A total of 311 post-Paleolithic motifs have been described in the cave, in which we can see a great economy of execution procedures and a lack of organization in the layout of the motifs, which are usually irregular and with poorly defined outlines. Once again, we can differentiate between four modes of engraving in these motifs. First, digital traces that form sinuous motifs called meandering or macaroni that produce a characteristic groove with a rounded profile. There are also scratched line engravings, probably made with a stick that produces an irregular U-shaped groove. Numerous grids were engraved with this technique throughout the cave. Simple, wide and deep engraving is very common. 
That's how the U-shaped bottom profiles and the traced and widened lines were made. This kind of incision is common in large panels, where it usually appears below finer line engravings. Finally, simple angular profile engraving is the most common technique of this period. It is used to create the designs of oval, quadrangular and fusiform structures, etc., which are the most typical angles and zigzags at the site. In terms of subject matter, geometric abstractions predominate. Reticulated ones stand out, but we also find tectiform, ladder-shaped or zigzag sets. In this period, the human figure and the animals are not represented. Post-Paleolithic representations are difficult to organize and differentiate from one another in the variegated schematic and abstract assemblages of the engravings. This is a consequence of the most outstanding characteristic of this stage, the superposition, which arises, perhaps, as a result of the search to group engravings of a similar theme in the same place, or simply by the accumulation of successive phases of drawing as a result of the reuse of the same panel at different times. More than a hundred inscriptions from the Roman period have been documented on the walls of La Griega Cave. We don't know what motivated the people from that period to enter the cave and engrave on its walls, but it is very likely that the presence of previous engravings didn't go unnoticed, and it's possible that the cave recovered its millenary sacred character at that time. It is curious to see how the Roman signs respected the Paleolithic drawings being located in nearby places, but without affecting them. From a chronological point of view, these Latin inscriptions date from the middle of the 1st century AD to the Visigothic period, which is a key document for understanding Romanization and the introduction of writing in the Northern Plateau. These testimonies, mostly personal names, also include allusions to private and public cults, mentions of indigenous divinities, and playful and anecdotal expressions. As a curiosity, in one of the most hidden places in the cave, on a ledge next to the wall, a crude figure modelled in soft clay was found, but its age cannot be determined, so it is difficult to relate it to the Latin inscriptions. However, the hypothesis that it's a Roman offering, comparable to those found in the Roman cave in the Roman city of Clunia, is tempting. Thanks to the academic studies focused on the cave of La Griega, engravings corresponding to medieval, modern and even contemporary historical periods have been dated, proving that the cave has continued to be frequented. There are special places that have a singular power of attraction and this is one of them. The cave of La Griega like a natural time machine, takes us to hidden places in our history in which human beings, in their specific social and religious context, tried to trap time in the rock, leaving a mark of their incursion into the subterranean world. <laughs>